Book One, Chapter One of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Fletcher, Hobart, Tasmania. Strangers and Pilgrims, Chapter One. Give me a look, give me a face that makes simplicity a grace, robes loosely flowing hair as free such sweet neglect more taketh me than all the adulteries of art they strike mine eyes but not my heart the scene was an ancient orchard on the slope of a hill in the far west of england an orchard bounded on one side by an old-fashioned garden where roses and carnations were blooming in their summer glory and on the other by a ponderous red brick wall heavily buttressed and with a moat at its outer base, a wall that had been built for the protection of a more important habitation than Hawley Vicarage. Time was when the green slope where the rugged apple trees spread their crooked limbs in the sunshine was a prim pleasance, and when the hill was crowned by the grim towers of Hawley Castle. But the civil wars made an end of the Gothic towers and machicolated galleries that had weathered many a storm, and nothing was now left save a remnant of the old wall and one solitary tower, to which some archaeologically-minded vicar in time past had joined the modest parsonage of Hawley Parish. This was a low white building of the farmhouse type, large and roomy, with bow windows to some of the lower rooms, and diamond-paned casements to others. In this western land of warm rains and flowers, the myrtles and roses climbed to the steeply sloping roof, and every antique casement was set in a frame of foliage and blossom. It was not a mansion which a modern architect would have been proud to have built by any means, but a dwelling-place with which a painter or a poet would have fallen madly in love at first sight. There were pigeons cooing and boop-boop-booping among the moss-grown corbels of the tower, a blackbird in a wicker cage hanging outside one of the narrow windows, a skylark in a little green wooden box decorating another. The garden, where the roses and carnations flourished, had somewhat of a neglected look, not weedy or forlorn, only a little unkempt and over-luxuriant, like a garden to which the hireling gardener comes once a week, or which is left to the charge of a single outdoor labourer who has horses and pigs upon his mind, nay, perhaps also the daily distraction of indoor duties in the boot and knife-cleaning way perhaps looking at the subject from a purely poetical point of view no garden should ever be better kept than that garden at hawley what ribbon bordering or artistically variegated mosaic of lobelia and petunia and calcellaria and verbena could ever equal the wild beauty of roses that grew at their own sweet will against a background of syringa and arbutus shrubs that must have been planted by some unknown benefactor in the remote past for no incumbent of late years had ever been known to plant anything what prim platter-like circles of well-behaved bedding out plants spick and span from the greenhouse could charm the sense like the various and yet familiar old world flowers that filled the long wide borders in parson lutterell's flower garden of this small domain, about half an acre consisted of meadow-like grass, not often improved by the roller, and sometimes permitted to flourish in rank luxuriance ankle-deep. The girls, that is to say Wilmot Lutterell's four daughters, managed to play croquet upon that greensward nevertheless, being at the croquet-playing stage of existence, when a young woman hard-driven would play croquet in an empty coal cellar. Near the house, the grass assumed form and dignity, and was bordered by a rugged sweep of loose gravel called the carriage drive. And just opposite the drawing-room windows, there stood an ancient stone sundial, on which the ladies of Hawley Castle had marked the slow passage of the empty hours in centuries gone by. Only a hedge of holly divided the garden from a strip of wasteland that bordered the dusty high-road, but a row of fine old elms grew on that intervening strip of grass and secured the lateral damsels from the gaze of the vulgar. But for seclusion, for the sweet sense of utter solitude and retirement, 
the orchard was best that undulating slope of mossy turf cropped close by occasional sheep which skirted the flower garden and stretched away to the rear of the low white house the very wall crowned with gaudy dragon's mouth and creeping yellow stone crop was in itself a picture and in the shelter of this wall which turned its stalwart old back to the west was the nicest spot for an afternoon's idleness over a new book or the worthless scrap of lace or muslin which constituted the last mania in the way of fancy work this at least was what elizabeth luttrell said of the old wall and as she had been born and reared for the nineteen years of her young life at hawley she was a tolerable judge of the capabilities of garden and orchard she sits in the shadow of the wall this june afternoon alone with an unread book in her lap elizabeth luttrell is the beauty of a family in which all the daughters are or have been handsome the peerless flower among four fair sisters who are renowned through this part of the western world as the pretty miss luttrells about gertrude the eldest or diana the second or blanche the youngest there might be differences of opinion a question raised as to the length of gertrude's nose a doubt as to the width of diana's mouth and a schism upon the merits of blanche's figure but the third daughter of the house of luttrell was simply perfect you could no more dispute her beauty than that of the florentine venus what a picture she made upon this midsummer afternoon as she sat in the shade of the ruddy old wall in a holland dress and with a blue ribbon twisted in her hair profile of face and figure in full relief against the warm background every line the perfection of grace and beauty every hue and every curve a study for a painter oh if among all the splendid fashion plates in the royal academy the duchess in black velvet train and point lace flounces and scarlet silk petticoats and diamonds the marchioness in blue satin and blonde and pearls the countess in white silk and azaleas the viscountess in tulle and rosebuds if in this feast of millinery elizabeth luttrell could but shine forth sitting by the orchard wall in her washed-out holland gown what a revelation that fresh young beauty would seem it was not a rustic beauty however not a loveliness created to be dressed in white muslin and to adorn a cottage but splendid rather and worthy to rule the heart of a great man nose a small aquiline eyes that darkly clear grey which in some lights deepens to violet complexion a warm brunette forehead low and broad hair of the darkest brown with ruddy golden beams lurking in its crisp waves hair which is in itself almost a sufficient justification for any young woman to set up as a beauty if her stock in trade were no more than those dark brown tresses those delicately arched brows and upward curling lashes in all the varying charms of expression as well as in regularity of feature nature has gifted elizabeth luttrell with a lavish hand she is the crystallization of centuries of dead and gone luttrells all more or less beautiful for the race is one that can boast of good looks as a family heritage she sits alone by the old wall the western sunlight shining through the red and yellow flowers of the dragon's mouth above her head sits alone and with loosely linked hands lying idle in her lap and fixed dreaming eyes it is nearly an hour since she has turned a leaf of her book when a ringing soprano voice calling her name and a shower of rose leaves thrown across her face scares away her daydreams she looks up impatiently angrily even at blanche the hoyden of the family who stands above her on the steep grassy slope with a basket of dilapidated roses on her arm the damsel incorrigibly idle alike by nature and habit has been seized with an industrious fit and has been clipping and trimming the roses what a lazy creature you are lizzie she exclaims i thought you were going to put the ribbons on your muslin dress for this evening i wish you'd be good enough to concern yourself about your own clothes blanche and leave mine alone and please don't come screaming at me when i'm asleep you weren't asleep your eyes were ever so wide open you were thinking i can guess what about and smiling at your own thoughts 
I wish I had anything as nice to think about. That's the worst of having a handsome sister. How can I suppose that anyone will take any notice of poor little me? Upon my honour, Blanche, I believe you are the most provoking girl in creation. You can't believe that, for you don't know all the girls in creation. One of the most, then. But that comes of sending a girl to school. You have all the schoolgirl vulgarities. I'm sure I didn't want to go to Miss Derwent's, Lizzie. It was Gertrude's fault making such a fuss about me and setting Papa at me. I'd much rather have run wild at home. I think you'd run wild anywhere, in a convent even. Oh, I dare say I should, but that's not the question. I want to know if you're going to wear your clean white muslin, because my own toilet hinges on your decision. It's a serious matter for girls who are only allowed one clean muslin a week. I don't know. Perhaps I shall wear my blue, replies Elizabeth with a careless air, pretending to read. You won't do anything of the kind. It's ever so tumbled, and I know you like to look nice when Mr. Ford is here. You're such a mean girl, Elizabeth Luttrell. You pretend not to care a straw how you dress, and dawdle here, making believe to read that stupid old volume of travels to the Victoria thingamabob, which the old foes of the book club chose for us, instead of some jolly novel. And when we've put on our veriest rags, you'll scamper up the back stairs just at the last moment, and come down a quarter of an hour after he has come, all over crisp muslin flounces and fresh pink ribbons, just as if you'd a French milliner at your beck and call. I really can't help it if I know how to put on my things a little better than you and Diana. I'm sure Gertrude is always nicely dressed. Hmm, yes, Gertrude has the brand of cane. Gertrude is a born old maid. One can see it in her neck ribbons and top knots. Now, how about the white muslin? I wish you wouldn't worry, Blanche. I shall wear exactly what I please. I will not be pestered by a younger sister. What's the time? The fourth Miss Luttrell drags a little Geneva silver watch from her belt by a black ribbon. A silver watch presented to her by her father on her fifteenth birthday. To be exchanged for a gold one, at some indefinite period of the vicar's existence, when a gleam of prosperity shall brighten the dull level of his financial career. He's given similar watches to all his daughters on their fifteenth birthdays. But Lizzie's lies forgotten, among disabled brooches and odd earrings in a trinket box on her dressing table. Elizabeth Luttrell does not care to note the progress of her days on a pale-faced Geneva timepiece, value something under five pounds. Half past five by me, says Blanche. And are you twenty minutes slow or twenty minutes fast? Well, I believe I'm five and twenty minutes slow. Then I shall come to dress in half an hour. I wish you'd just tack those pink bows on my dress, Blanche. You're evidently at a loss for something to do. Just tack, repeats the younger sister with a wry face. You mean sew them on, I suppose. That's like people asking you to touch the bell when you're comfortably coiled up in an easy chair at the other end of the room. It sounds less than asking one to ring it, but one has to disturb oneself all the same. I don't see why you shouldn't sew on your own ribbons. And I'm dead tired. I've been standing in the broiling sun for the last hour, trimming the roses and trying to make the garden look a little decent. Oh, very well. I can get my dress ready myself, says Elizabeth with a grand air not lifting her eyes from the volume in which she struggles vainly to follow the current of the Victoria Nyanza. Has not Malcolm Ford expressed the respectful wish that she were a little less vague in her notions of all that vast world which lies beyond the market town and rustic suburbs of Hawley? Don't be offended, Lizzie. You know I always do anything you ask me. Where are the ribbons? In the left-hand top drawer. Be sure you don't tumble my flounces. I'll take care. I'm so glad you're going to wear your white, for now I can wear mine without Gertrude grumbling about my extravagance in beginning a clean muslin at the end of the week. 
as if people with any pretence to refinement ever made any difference in their gowns at the end of the week as if anybody but utter barbarians would go grubby because it was friday or saturday mind you come upstairs in time to dress lizzie i shall be ready child the people are not to be here till seven the people as if you cared one straw about jane harrison or laura melvin in that preposterous brother of hers you manage to flirt with the preposterous brother at any rate says lizzie still looking down at her book oh one must get one's hand in somehow and as if there were any choice of a subject in this godforsaken place blanche how can you use such horrid expressions but it is godforsaken i heard captain fielding call it so the other day you're always picking up somebody's phrases now do go and tack on those ribbons or i shall have to do it myself oh and that would be a calamity cries blanche laughing when there's anybody else whose services you can utilize it was one of the golden rules of elizabeth luttrell's life that she should never do anything for herself which she could get any one else to do for her what was the good of having three unmarried sisters all plainer than oneself unless one made some use of them she herself had grown up like a flower as beautiful and as useless not to toil or spin only to be admired and cherished as a type of god-given idle loveliness that her beauty was to be profitable to herself and to the world by and by in some large way she regarded as an inevitable consequence of her existence she had troubled herself very little about the future had scarcely chafed against the narrow bounds of her daily life that certainty of high fortune awaiting her in the coming years supported and sustained her in the meanwhile she lived her life a life not altogether devoid of delight but into which the element of passion had not yet entered even in so dull a place as hawley there were plenty of admirers for such a girl as elizabeth luttrell she had drunk freely of the nectar of praise knew the full measure of her beauty and felt that she was bound to conquer all the little victories the trivial flirtations of the present were in her mind mere child's play but they served to give some variety to an existence which would have been intolerably monotonous without them she went on reading or trying to read for half an hour after blanche had skipped up the green slope where the apple trees spread a fantastic carpet of light and shade in the afternoon sunshine she tried her hardest to chain her thoughts to that book of african travel but the victoria nyanza eluded her like a will-o'-the-wisp her thoughts went back to a little scene under an avenue of ancient limes in hawley road a scene that had been acted only a few hours ago it was not very much to think of only an accidental meeting with her father's curate malcolm ford only a little commonplace talk about the parish and the choir the early services and the latest volumes obtainable at the hawley book club mr luttrell had employed four curates since lizzie's sixteenth birthday and the first second and third of these young levites had been lizzie's devoted slaves it had become an established rule that the curate mr luttrell could only afford one though there were two churches in his duty should fall madly in love with elizabeth but the fourth curate was of a different stuff from the material out of which the three simpering young gentlemen fresh from college were created malcolm ford was five and thirty years of age a man who had been a soldier and who had taken up this new service from conviction a man who possessed an income amply sufficient for his own simple needs and in no way looked to the church as an honourable manner of solving the great enigma of how a gentleman is to maintain himself in the world he was a christian in the purest and widest sense of the word an earnest thinker an indefatigable worker an enthusiast upon all subjects relating to his beloved church to such a man as this all small flirtations and girlish follies must needs appear trivial in the extreme but mr ford was not a prig nor was he prone to parade his piety before the eyes of the world so he fell into the ways of hawley with consummate ease played croquet with the mallet of a master 
disliked high jinks and grandiose entertainments at rich people's houses but was not above an impromptu picnic with his intimate associate a gypsy tea in everton wood or a friendly musical evening at the parsonage he had little time to devote to such relaxations but did not disdain them on occasion at the outset of their acquaintance the four lateral girls vowed they should always be afraid of him that those dreadful cold grey eyes of his made them feel uncomfortable when he looks at me in that grave searching way i positively feel myself the wickedest creature in the world cried diana who was of a sprightly disposition and prone to a candid confession of all her weaknesses how i should hate to marry such a man it would be like being perpetually brought face to face with one's conscience i think a woman's husband ought in a manner to represent her conscience said gertrude who was nine and twenty and prided herself upon being serious-minded at least i should like to see all my faults and follies reflected in my husband's face and to grow out of them by his influence what a hard time your husband would have of it gertie exclaimed the flippant blanche assisting at the conversation from outside the open window of the breakfast-room or den in which the four damsels were as untidy as they pleased elizabeth's colour-box and drawing-board gertrude's work-box diana's desk and blanche's dorcas bag all heaped pell-mell upon the battered old sideboard if you spent more time among the poor diana said gertrude not deigning to notice this interruption you need not be afraid of any man's eyes when our own hearts are at peace oh don't please gertie don't give me any warmed-up versions of your tracts the state of my own heart has nothing to do with the question if i were the most spotless being in creation i should feel just the same about mr ford's eyes as for district visiting you know very well that my health was never good enough for that sort of thing i am sure if papa had six daughters instead of four you do enough in the goody-goody line for the whole batch miss luttrell gave a gentle sigh and continued her needlework in silence she could not help feeling that she was the one bit of leaven that leavened the whole lump that if a general destruction were threatened by the daughters of hawley by reason of their frivolities her own sterling merits might buy them off as the ten righteous men who were not to be found in sodom might have ransomed that guilty population elizabeth had been busy painting a little bit of still life an overripe peach and a handful of pansies and mulberry leaves lying loosely scattered at the base of mr luttrell's venetian claret flask she had gone steadily on with her work laying on little dabs of transparent colour with a quick light touch and not vouchsafing any expression of interest in the discussion of mr ford's peculiarities he's very good-looking diana said meditatively don't you think so lizzie you're an authority upon curates elizabeth shrugged her shoulders and answered in her most indifferent tone tolerably he has a rather good forehead rather good exclaimed gertrude grinding industriously across an expanse of calico with her cutting out scissors he has the forehead of an apostle how do you know that you never saw an apostle cried blanche from the window with her favourite line of argument and as for the pictures we see of them that's all humbug for there were no photographers in judea come indoors blanche and write a german exercise said gertrude it's too bad to stand out there all the mornings idling away your time and spoiling your complexion into the bargain added diana what a tawny little wretch you are becoming i don't care two straws about my complexion and i'm not going to cramp my hand with that horrid german think of the privilege of being able to read schiller in the original said gertrude solemnly i don't think much of it for i never see you read him though you do pride yourself on your german answered the flippant blanche and then they went back to mr ford 
and discussed his eyes and forehead again not arriving at any very definite expression of opinion at the last and elizabeth holding her ideas in reserve i don't think this one will be quite like the rest liz said diana significantly what do you mean by like the rest why he won't make a fool of himself about you as mr horton did with his flute playing and stuff and he won't go on like mr dysart and he won't write sentimental poetry and languish all the afternoon spooning at croquet like little mr adderley you needn't count upon making a conquest of him lizzie he has the ideas of a monk abelard was destined to become a monk replied elizabeth calmly but that did not prevent his falling in love with eloise oh i dare say you think it will end by his being as weak as the rest but he told me that he does not approve of a priest marrying rather rude wasn't it when you considered that we should not be in existence if papa had entertained the same opinion i don't suppose we count for much in his grand ideas of religion answered elizabeth a little contemptuously she had held her small flirtations with previous curates as the merest trifling but the trifling had been pleasant enough in its way she had liked the incense and behold here was a man who withheld all praise who had made his own scheme of life a scheme from which she elizabeth luttrell was excluded it was a new thing for her to find that she counted for nothing in the existence of any young man who knew her this conversation took place when mr ford had been at hawley about a month time slipped past malcolm ford took the parish in hand with a firm grip mr luttrell being an easy-going gentleman quite agreeable to let his curate work as hard as he liked where there had been two services on a sunday there were now four where there had been one service on a great church festival there were now five the dim old aisles bloomed with flowers at easter and ascension at whitsuntide and harvest thanksgiving feast and the damsels of hawley had new work to do in the decoration of the churches and in the embroidery of chalice covers and altar cloths but it was not only in extra services and beautification of the temples alone that mr ford brought about a new aspect of affairs in hawley the poor were cared for as they had never been cared for before almost all the time that the soldier curate could spare from his public duties he devoted to private ministration and yet when he did permit himself an afternoon's recreation he came to gypsy tea drinking or croquet with as fresh an air as if he were a man who lived only for pleasure above all he never preached sermons out of the pulpit that was his one merit lizzie luttrell said in a somewhat disparaging tone <clears throat> his one fault is to be so unlike the other curates liz and to be able to resist your blandishments said diana sharply mr ford had made himself a favourite with all that household except elizabeth the other three girls worshipped him she rarely mentioned him without a sneer and yet she was thinking of him this midsummer afternoon as she sat by the orchard wall trying to read the volume he had recommended she was thinking of a few grave words in which he had confessed his interest in her thinking of the dark searching eyes which had looked for one brief moment into her own i really thought i counted for nothing she said to herself he has such off-hand ways and sets himself so much above other people i don't think he quite means to be grand it seems natural to him he ought to have been a general at least in india instead of a tuppenny halfpenny captain the half-hour was soon gone it was very pleasant to her that idling in the shadow of the old wall for the thoughts of her morning's walk were strangely sweet sweeter than any flatteries that had ever been whispered in her ear and yet mr ford had not praised her had indeed seemed utterly unconscious of her superiority to other women his words had been frank and grave and kindly a little too much like a lecture perhaps and yet sweet 
for they were the first words in which Malcolm Ford had betrayed the faintest interest in her welfare. And it is a hard thing for a young woman who has been a goddess and an angel in the sight of three consecutive curates to find the fourth as indifferent to her merits as if he were a man of stone. Yes, he had decidedly lectured her. That is to say, he had spoken a little regretfully of her trivial wasted life, her neglected opportunities. I don't know what you mean by opportunities, she had answered, with a little contemptuous curl of the rosy upper lip. I can't burst out all at once into a female bishop. As for district visiting, I've really no genius for that kind of thing, and feel myself a useless bore in poor people's houses. I know I've been rather idle about the church embroidery, too, she added with a deprecating air, feeling that here he had cause for complaint. I am very anxious that our churches should be made beautiful, he answered gravely, and I think it only natural for you to take a delight in that kind of labour. But I do not consider ecclesiastical embroidery the beginning and end of life. I should like to see you more interested in the poor and in the schools, more interested in your fellow creatures altogether, in short. I fancy the life you lead at Hawley Vicarage among your roses and apple trees is just a little the life of the lotus eater. All its allotted length of days the flower ripens in its place, ripens and fades and falls and hath no toil, fast rooted in the fruitful soil. It doesn't do for a responsible being to live that kind of life, you know, leaving no better memory behind than the record of its beauty. I should hardly venture to say so much as this, Miss Luttrell, if I were not warmly interested in you. The clear, pale face, looking downward with a rather moody air, like the face of a wayward child that can hardly suffer a rebuke, flushed sudden crimson at his last words. To Mr. Ford's surprise, for the interest he had confessed was of a purely priestly kind. But young women are so sensitive, and he was not unused to see his female parishioners blush and tremble a little under the magnetism of his earnest gaze and low, grave voice. Conscious of that foolish blush, Elizabeth tried to carry off her confusion by a rather flippant laugh. Oh, you read your Tennyson, you see she said, though you lecture me for my idleness. Isn't poetry a kind of lotus-eating? Oh, hardly, I think. I don't consider my duty stern enough to cut me off from all the flowers of life. I should be sorry to moon about with a duodecimo Tennyson in my pocket when I ought to be at work, but when I have a stray half-hour I can give myself a little indulgence of that kind. Besides, Tennyson is something more than a poet. He is a teacher. You will come to play croquet for an hour this evening, won't you? Gertrude wrote to you yesterday, I think. Ah, yes. I must apologise for not answering her note. I shall be most happy to come, if possible. But I have two or three sick people to visit this afternoon, and I'm not quite sure of my time. The poor souls cling to one so at last. They want a friendly hand to grasp on the threshold of the dark valley, and they have some dim notion that we hold the keys of the other world and can open a door for them and let them through to a better place than they could win for themselves. Oh, it must be dreadful to see so much of death, said Elizabeth with a faint shudder. Oh, hardly so dreadful as you may suppose. A deathbed develops some of the noblest qualities of man's nature. I have seen so much unselfish thoughtfulness for others, so much tenderness and love in the dying. And then, for these poor people, life has been for the most part so barren, so troubled, it's like passing away from a perpetual struggle to a land that is to be all brightness and rest. If you'd only spend more time among your father's parishioners, Miss Luttrell, you would learn much that is worth learning of life and death. Oh, I couldn't endure it, she answered, shrugging her shoulders impatiently. 
i ought never to have been born a parson's daughter i should do no good but harm more likely the people would see how miserable i thought them and be all the more discontented with their wretched lots after my visits i can't act goody-goody as gertrude does and make these poor wretches believe that i think the nicest thing in the world is to live in one room and have hardly bread to eat and only one blanket among six it's too dreadful six weeks of it would kill me mr ford sighed ever so faintly but said no more what a poor selfish narrow soul this lovely girl's must be nature does sometimes enshrine her commonest spirits in these splendid temples he felt a little disappointed by the girl's selfishness and coldness for he had imagined that she needed only to be awakened from the happy idleness of a young joy-loving spirit he said no more though they walked side by side as far as st mary's the red square towered church at the beginning of the town and parted with perfect friendliness yet the thought of that interview vexed malcolm ford all day long i had hoped better things of her he said to himself but of course i shan't give up she is so young and seems to have a pliant disposition what a pity that luttrell has let his daughters grow up just as they please like the foxgloves in his hedges in mr ford's opinion these four young women ought to have been trained into a little band of sisters of mercy a pious sisterhood carrying life and light into the dark alleys of hawley it was not a large place that western market town numbering eleven thousand souls in all yet there were alleys enough and moral darkness and poverty and sickness and sorrow enough to make work for a nunnery of ministering women mr ford had plenty of district visitors ready to labour for him but they were for the most part ill-advised and frivolous ministrants and absorbed more of his time by their need of counsel and supervision than he cared to give them they were of the weakest order of womanhood craving perpetual support and assistance wanting all of them to play the ivy to mr ford's oak and no oak however vigorous could have sustained such a weight of ivy he had to tell them sometimes in plainest words that if they couldn't do their work without continual recourse to him their work was scarcely worth having whereupon the weaker vessels dropped away admitting in their high church slang that they had no vocation that is to say there was too much bread and too little sack in the business too much of the poor and not enough of mr ford for this reason he liked gertrude luttrell who went about her work in a womanlike way rarely applied to him for counsel had her own opinions and really did achieve some good it may have been for this reason and in his desire to oblige gertrude that he made a little effort and contrived to play croquet in the vicarage garden on this midsummer evening end of chapter one book one chapter two of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org strangers and pilgrims chapter two best leave or take the perfect creature take all she is or leave complete transmute you will not form or feature change feet for wings or wings for feet it was halcyon weather for croquet not a cloud in the warm summer sky and promise of a glorious sunset red and glowing for the shepherd's delight the grass had been shorn that morning and was soft and thick and sweet with a thymy perfume a little uneven here and there but affording so much more the opportunity for the players to prove themselves superior to small difficulties the roses and syringa were in their midsummer glory and from the white walls of the vicarage came the sweet odours of jasmine and honeysuckle clematis and myrtle all sweet-scented flowers seemed to grow here with a wider luxuriance than malcolm ford had ever seen anywhere else his own small patrimony was on a northern soil 
and all his youthful recollections were of a bleaker land than this oh an enervating climate i'm afraid he said to himself and it seemed to him that the roses and syringa might be a snare there was something stifling in the slumberous summer air and the arcadian luxury of syllabub and cream and the verdure and blossom of this flowery land he felt as if his soul must needs stagnate as if life must become too much an affair of the senses in so sweet and sensuous a clime this was but a passing fancy which flashed upon him as he opened the broad white gate and went into the garden where the four girls in their white gowns and various ribbons were scattered on the grass blanche striking the last hoop into place with her mallet diana trying a stroke at loose croquet gertrude busy at a tea-table placed in the shade of a splendid spanish chestnut which spread its branches low and wide making a tent of greenery beneath which a dozen people could dine in comfort elizabeth apart from all the rest standing by the sundial tall and straight as a dart looking like a greek princess in the days when the gods fell in love with the daughters of earthly kings mr ford was not a greek god but a faint thrill stirred his senses at the sight of that gracious figure by the sundial nevertheless only an artist delight in perfect beauty the life which he had planned for himself was in most things the life of a monk but he couldn't help feeling that elizabeth luttrell was perfectly beautiful and that for a man of a weaker stamp there might be danger in this friendly association which brought them together somehow two or three times in every week i have known her a year and she has never touched my heart in the faintest degree he told himself with some sense of triumph in the knowledge that he was impervious to such fascinations if we were immortal and could go on knowing each other for thirty years she forever beautiful and young i forever in the prime of manhood i do not think she would be any nearer to me than she is now mr ford was the first of the guests the three girls ran forward to receive him greeting him with a kind of rapture it was so good of him to come they gushed out simultaneously they felt as if a saint had come to take the first red ball and mallet gertrude always gave mr ford the red ringed balls she said they reminded her of the rubric elizabeth stirred not at all she stood by the sundial her face to the west contemplative or simply indifferent mr ford could not tell which did she see him he wondered and deliberately refrain from greeting him or was she so lost in thought as to be unconscious of his presence or did she resent his little lecture of that morning oh she could hardly do that he considered when they'd parted in perfect friendship it is so good of you to be punctual said gertrude making a pleasant little jingling with the china teacups the best china all blue and gold hoarded away in the topmost of cupboards wrapped in much silver paper and only taken down for festive tea drinkings like this it was not a kettle drum tea but a rustic feast rather or a tea shuffle as mr melvin the lawyer called it there was a round table covered with a snowy tablecloth and laden with home produce a pound cake of golden hue preserved fruits of warm red and amber tint in sparkling cut glass jars that standing dish on west country tables a junket home-made bread with the brown kissing crust that never comes from the hireling baker's oven tea cakes of feathery lightness and rich yellow butter which to the epicure might have been worth a journey from london to devonshire and for the crowning glory of the banquet a capacious basket of strawberries and a bowl of clotted cream the melvins are always late said diana but we're not going to let you wait for your tea mr ford are we gertrude here comes anne with the kettle the silver tea kettle was the pride of the luttrell household it had been presented to mr luttrell at the close of his ministrations in a former parish and was engraved with the luttrell coat of arms in all the splendour of its numerous quarterings a spirit lamp burned beneath this sacred vessel 
which gertrude tended as carefully as if she had been a vestal virgin watching the immortal flame mr ford insisted that they should wait for the rest of the company he did not languish for that cup of tea wherewith miss lutterell was eager to refresh his tired frame perhaps in such a moment his thoughts may have glanced back to the half-forgotten mess-table and its less innocent banquets the long table glittering in the low sunshine with its bright array of fairy glass and costly silver was not his corps renowned for its taste in these trifles the pleasant familiar faces the talk and laughter time was when he had lived his life and that altogether another life differing in every detail from his existence of to-day holding not one hope or dream or project which he cherished now he could look back at those idle pleasures those aimless days without the faintest sigh of regret saddened discouraged faint-hearted he had often been since this pilgrimage of his was begun but never for one weak moment had he looked longingly back he said a few words to blanche who blushed and sparkled and answered him in little gasps with upward worshipping gaze as if he had indeed been an apostle she played the harmonium in st mary's the old of the two churches which did not boast an organ and then he strolled across the grass to the sundial where lizzie was standing in mute contemplation of the western sky they shook hands almost silently he did not intend to apologise for what he had said that morning if the reproof had stung her so much the better he had meant to reprove and yet it pained him a little to think that he had offended her how lovely she was as she stood before him smiling in the western sunshine he never remembered having seen anything so beautiful except a face of guido's the face of the virgin mother in a roman picture gallery that smile relieved his mind a little she could hardly be offended you've had a fatiguing day i suppose with your sick people she said suddenly after a few words about the beauty of the evening and the unpunctuality of their friends do you know i've been thinking of what you said to me this morning all day long and i begin to feel that i must do something it seems almost as if i had had what evangelical people describe as a call i should really like to do something i don't suppose any good will come of it i know it's not my line and i'm rather sorry you tried to awaken my slumbering conscience but you must tell me what i am to do i am your pupil you know madame de chantelle saint francis she looked up at him with her thrilling smile the deep violet eyes just lifted for a moment to his own with a glance which was swift and sudden as the flight of an arrow across his mind there flashed the memory of medieval legends of witchcraft and crime records of priestly passion of women whose noxious presence had brought shame upon holy sisterhoods of infatuation so fatal as to seem the inspiration of satan of baneful beauty that had lighted the way to the torture chamber and the stake an idle memory in such a moment what had he to do with those dark passions the fungus growth of an age that was all darkness i think your father is more than competent to advise you he answered gravely oh no man is a prophet in his own country she said carelessly i should never think of talking to papa about spiritual things we have too many painful interviews upon the subject of pocket money if you want to reclaim me you must help me a little mr ford but perhaps i am not worth the trouble you cannot doubt that i should be glad to be of use to you but it would be presumption on my part to dictate your own good sense will prompt you and you have an admirable counsellor in your sister gertrude my best district visitor i should never submit to be drilled by gertrude oh no if you won't help me i must wait for inspiration oh, as for district visiting i can't tell you how i hate the very notion of it if there were another crimean war now i should like to go out as a nursing sister 
Uh, especially if she looked at him with another briefly mischievous glance if there were nice people to nurse i'm afraid young ladies whose inclinations point to a military theatre are hardly in the right road he said coldly he felt that she was trifling with him and was inclined to be angry he walked away from the sundial towards the hall door from which mr luttrell was slowly emerging an elderly gentleman tall and stout with a still handsome face framed in silky grey whiskers and a slightly worn-out air as of a man who had mistaken his vocation and never quite recovered his discovery of the mistake very good of you to come and play croquet with my children ford he said in his good-natured lazy way he had called them children when they were all in the nursery and he called them children still especially as i don't think it's particularly in your line ah here come the melvins and miss harrison so i suppose we're to begin tea in order that you may have an hour's daylight for your game elizabeth had walked away from the sundial in an opposite direction smiling softly to herself it was something to have made him angry she had seen the pale dark face flush hotly for a moment a sudden fire kindled in the deep grey eyes in the morning he had confessed himself interested in her welfare and in the evening she had contrived to provoke him that was something gained he's not quite a block of stone she thought she didn't trouble herself to come forward and welcome the melvin party any more than she troubled herself to greet mr ford but came strolling across the grass towards the tea-table presently when every one else was seated the guest here and there under the chestnut branches while gertrude sat at the table dispensing the teacups with frederick melvin in attendance mr melvin was the eldest son of the chief solicitor of hawley in partnership with his father and vaguely supposed to be eligible from a matrimonial point of view he was a young man who had an unlimited capacity for croquet vingt et un table turning and small flirtations spent all his spare hours on the river table and seemed hardly at home out of a suit of boating flannels he was indifferently in love with the four miss luttrells with a respectful leaning towards elizabeth as the beauty and he was generally absorbed by the flippant blanche his sister laura sangwell and did nothing else to particularise herself in the minds of her acquaintances she was fond of music and discoursed learnedly of symphonies and sonatas adagios in c flat and capriccios in f double sharp to the terror of the uninitiated miss harrison was a cousin whose people were of the gentleman farmer persuasion and who came from a sleepy old homestead up the country to stay with the melvins and intoxicate her young senses with the dissipations of hawley market-place the melvins lived in the market-place in a big square brick house picked out with white a house with three rows of windows five in a row a flight of steps and a green door with a brass knocker the very house one would suppose upon which all the dolls houses ever manufactured have been modelled she was not a very brilliant damsel and when she had been asked how she liked hawley after the country and how she liked the country after hawley and whether she liked hawley or the country best conversation with her was apt to languish mr ford who was sitting a little in the background talking to mr luttrell rose and gave his chair to elizabeth the last comer he brought another for himself and sat down again and went on with his talk while frederick melvin worshipped at elizabeth's shrine offering tea and pound cake and strawberries and unutterable devotion oh, i wish you'd go and flirt with blanche she said coolly no thanks i don't want any strawberries now please don't sprinkle a shower of them on my dress i shall have to wear it a week how awkward you are who could help being awkward pleaded the youth blushing sir charles grandison would have made a fool of himself in your society i don't know anything about sir charles grandison and i don't believe you do either that's the way with you young men 
you get the names of people and things out of the saturday review and pretend to know everything under the sun oh, wasn't he a fellow in some book oh, pamela or joseph andrews something of smollett's some sort of rubbish in sixteen volumes nobody reads it nowadays then i wouldn't quote it if i were you but the saturday review is the modern substitute for the eton latin grammar please go and flirt with blanche you always stand so close to one making a doormat of one's dress oh very well i'll go and talk to blanche but remember this with a threatening air when you want to go on the table you'll take me of course i know that run and play there's a dear child he was her senior by three years but she gave herself ineffable airs of superiority notwithstanding perhaps she was not displeased to exhibit even this trumpery swain before the eyes of malcolm ford who went on talking of parish matters with her father as if unconscious of her presence very little execution was done upon the pound cake or the syllabub the atmosphere was too heavily charged with flirtations for any serious consumption of provisions it is the people who have done with the flowers and sunshine of life who make the most havoc amongst the lobster salad and raised pies at a picnic for whom the bouquet of the moselle is a question of supreme importance who know the difference between a hawk and a heron in the way of claret so after a little trifling with the dainty cakes miss luttrell had hospitably provided the young people rose for the business of the evening wouldn't you rather have a cigar and a glass of claret here under the chestnut said mr luttrell as malcolm ford prepared to join them that would be a breach of covenant answered the curate laughing i was invited for croquet besides i really enjoy the game it's a sort of substitute for billiards a dissipation you have renounced said the vicar in his careless way you modern young men are regular trappists whereby it will be seen that wilmot luttrell was of the broad church party a man who had hunted the devonian red deer in his time who had still a brace of joe mansons in his study was good at fly fishing and did not object to clerical billiards or a social rubber they played for a couple of hours in the balmy summer evening the luttrell girls and their four visitors played until the sunlight faded into dusk and the dusk deepened into a soft june night which was hardly night but rather a tender mixture of twilight and starshine gertrude had taken mr ford for the leader of her side miss harrison and blanche luttrell making up their four the beauty headed a skirmishing party that incorrigible frederick for her supporter dr luttrell and laura melvin bringing up the rear to her malcolm ford addressed no word throughout the little tournament it may have been because he had no opportunity for she was laughing and talking more or less all the time in the wildest spirits with the young solicitor perpetually at her elbow and gertrude had a great deal to say to the curate chiefly on the subject of her parish work and a little of a more vague and metaphysical nature concerning the impressions produced upon her mind by his last sunday evening sermon he listened kindly and respectfully as in duty bound but that frivolous talk and laughter upon the other side worried him not a little never had elizabeth seemed to him so vulgarly provincial and he was really interested in her as indeed it was his duty to be interested in the welfare of his vicar's daughters it's all the father's fault he said to himself i do not believe he's ever made the faintest attempt to train them and then he thought what an estimable young person gertrude must be to have evolved out of her inner consciousness as it were all that serious and practical piety which made her so valuable to him in his ministrations as to the future careers of the other three of blanche who talked slang and seemed to consider this lower world designed to be a perpetual theatre for flirtation of diana who was selfish and idle and set up a pretence of weak health as a means of escaping all the cares and perplexities of existence of elizabeth 
who appeared in her own character to embody all the faults and weaknesses he had ever supposed possible to a woman of the manner in which these three were to tread the troubled paths of life he could only think with a shudder poor lampless virgins straying blindly into the darkness and yet measured by a simply sensuous standard how sweet was that low rippling sound of girlish laughter how graceful the white-robed figure moving lightly in the summer dusk how exquisite the dark blue eyes that looked at him in the starlight when the game was ended and the church militant as blanche said pertly had been triumphant over the devil's own in the person of the mild-eyed frederick melvin mr ford's unerring stroke mathematically correct as to the pendulum had brought them home in spite of some rather feeble playing on the part of gertrude whose mind was a little too much occupied by last sunday evening's sermon mr luttrell had strolled up and down the garden walk smoking his cigar and had loitered a little by the holly hedge talking to some people in the road while the croquet players amused themselves he came forward now to propose an adjournment to the house and a claret cup so they all went crowding into a long low room with a couple of bow windows a room which was lined with bookshelves on one side containing taylor and hooker and barrow and tillotson and south and venn and other ecclesiastical volumes freely intermingled with a miscellaneous collection of secular literature a room which served mr luttrell as a library but which was nevertheless the drawing-room there was a grand piano by one of the bow windows a piano which had been presented to diana by a wealthy aunt and godmother and the brand new walnut wood case whereof was in strong contrast with the time-worn old chairs and tables the chiffoniers of the early georgian era the ponderous old cane-seated sofa with its chintz-covered pillows and painted frame a pale pale green picked out with gold that was fast vanishing away the attenuated crystal girandoles upon the high wooden mantel-shelf were almost as old as the invention of glass the chelsea shepherd and shepherdess had been cracked over and over again but held together as if by a charmed existence the derbyshire spa vases were relics of a dead and gone generation the mock venetian mirror was of an almost forgotten fashion and a quite extinct manufacture blanche vowed that noah and his wife when they kept house before the flood must have had just such a drawing-room yet this antiquated chamber seemed in no wise displeasing to the sight of mr ford as he came in from the starlit garden he liked it a great deal better than many finer rooms in which he was a rare but welcome visitor just as he preferred the ill-kept vicarage lawn and flower borders to the geometrical parterres of millionaire cloth manufacturers or pompous squires on the outskirts of hawley frederick melvin and his sister pleaded for a little music upon which the usual family concert began a showy fantasia by gertrude correctly played with a good firm finger and not a spark of expression from the first bar to the bang 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 at the end then a canzonet from blanche of the oh tis merry when the cherry and the blossom and the berry tra-la-la tra-la-la school in a thin little soprano and then a sonata beethoven's adieu by miss melvin which mr ford thought the longest adieu he had ever been obliged to listen to he lost patience at last and went over to elizabeth whose ripe round mezzo soprano tones he languished to hear won't you sing something he asked oh what does not singing come within your catalogue of forbidden pleasures a mere idle waste of time lotus eating in short you know that i do not think anything of the kind why do you try to make me out what i have never pretended to be an ascetic or worse a pharisee is it only because i am anxious that you should be of a little more use to your fellow creatures and of course singing can be no use unless i went about among your cottage people leading off the hymns does that mean you won't sing to-night he asked in his coldest tone yes 
then i'll wish you good night i've no doubt the music we've been hearing is very good in its way but it's hardly my way good night i'll slip away quietly without disturbing your friends he was close to the open bow window that farthest from the piano and went out unnoticed while miss melvin and her cousin miss harrison were debating whether they should or should not play the overture to zampa he went out of the window and walked slowly across the grass but had hardly reached the sundial when he heard the voice he knew so well swell out rich and full in the opening tones of a ballad he loved a plaintive lament called etheric have you no message for me he stopped by the sundial and heard the song to the end heard fred melvin supplicating for another song and elizabeth's impatient refusal she was tired to death with a little nervous laugh he went away after this not offended only wondering that any woman could be so wilful could take so much pains to render herself unwomanly and unlovable he thought how keenly another man whose life was differently planned might have felt this petty slight how dangerous to such a man's peace elizabeth luttrell might have been but that was all he was not angry with her what would he have thought if he could have seen elizabeth luttrell half an hour later that night if he could have seen her fall on her knees by one of the little french beds in the room that she and blanche occupied together and bury her face in the counterpane and burst into a passion of tears oh, what is the matter liz oh, what is it darling cries blanche the impulsive the girl answers nothing but sobs out her brief passion and then rises calm as a statue to confront her sister if you are going to worry me blanche i shall sleep in the passage she exclaims in impatient rebuke of the other's sympathetic caress there's nothing the matter i'm tired that's all and that absurd fred of yours has persecuted me so all the evening he's no fred of mine and i think you rather encouraged his persecutions said blanche with an aggrieved air i'm sure i can't make you out lizzie i thought you liked mr ford and yet you quite snubbed him to-night snubbed him cried elizabeth as if anybody could snub saint paul end of chapter two book one chapter three of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book One, Chapter Three I know thy forms are studied arts, thy subtle ways be narrow straits, thy courtesy but sudden starts, and what thou calls thy gifts are baits. The curate of Hawley, modest in his surroundings as the incorruptible Maximilian Robespierre himself, had lodgings at a carpenter's his landlord was certainly the chief carpenter of the town a man of unblemished respectability who had even infused a flavour of building into his trade but the curate's bedroom windows commanded a view of the carpenter's yard and he lived in the odour of chips and shavings and that fresh piney smell which seems to breathe the perfume of a thousand ships far away from the barren main he had even to submit meekly to the dismal tap 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 of the hammer when a coffin was on hand which might fairly serve as a substitute for the frere il faut mourir of the trappist brotherhood it must not be supposed however that this choice of a lodging was an act of asceticism or wanton self-humiliation upon the part of malcolm ford the hawley curates lodged as a rule with humphreys the carpenter and hawley being self-governed for the most part under strictly conservative principles it would have been an outrage against this sacred existing order of things if mr ford had pitched his tent elsewhere mrs humphreys was a buxom middle-aged woman of spotless cleanliness 
who kept a cow in a neat little paddock behind the carpenter's yard a woman who had a pleasant odour of dairy about her and who was supposed by long practice to have acquired a special faculty for doing for curates i know their taste she would say to her gossips and it's astonishing how little their taste varies oh give me a chop mrs humphreys they mostly says if i wear it them about their dinner but lo oh, i know better than that their poor stomach would soon turn against chops if they had them every day so i soon leaves off asking them anything about dinner which contrives to give them a a nice variety of tasty little dishes a whiten and a lamb cutlet or two with fried parsley one day a red mullet and a split fowl broiled with a half dozen mushrooms the next a spitch cook they call it and then the day after i curry what's left of the fowl so as their bills come moderate and i never had a wry word with any curate yet except mr adderley who didn't like squab pie and i did give him a piece of my mind about that the rooms were comfortable rooms though of the plainest lightsome and airy furnished with chairs and tables so substantial that their legs had not been enfeebled by the various fidgetinesses of a whole generation of curates honest wide-seated leather-bottomed chairs bought at the sack of an ancient manor-house stalwart walnut wood tables and brass-handled chests of drawers made when george the second was king mrs humphreys was wont to boast that her joe meaning mr joseph humphreys knew what chairs and tables were and did not choose them for their looks there were no ornaments of the usual lodging-house type for mrs humphreys knew that it was in the nature of curates to bring with them sundry knick-knacks the relics of university extravagances wherewith to decorate their chambers mr ford had furnished both sitting-room and bedroom amply with books nay even the slip of a chamber where he kept his baths and sponges and boot-stand was encumbered with the shabbier volumes in his collection piled breast-high in the angles of the walls he was not a collector of bric-a-brac and the sole ornaments of his sitting-room were a brass skeleton clock which had travelled many a league with him in his soldiering days a carefully painted miniature of an elderly lady whom by the likeness to himself one might reasonably suppose to be his mother on one side of the mantelpiece and a somewhat faded dagger a type of a sweet fair young face on the other and a breakfast cup and saucer on a little ebony stand under a glass shade why this cup and saucer should be so preserved would have been a puzzling question for a stranger they were of ordinary modern china and could have possessed no value from an artistic point of view he had performed his early morning duty at st clement's and spent half an hour with a sick parishioner before his nine o'clock breakfast on the day following that little croquet party at the vicarage he was dawdling a little as he sipped his second cup of tea with one of southey's commonplace books open at his elbow turning over the leaves now and then with a somewhat absent air as if in all that jetsam and flotsam of the poet's studious hours he hardly found a paragraph to enchain his attention what manner of man is he in outward semblance as he sits there absent and meditative with the broad summer daylight on his face it would be a question if one should call him a handsome man he is distinguished looking perhaps rather than handsome tall and broad-shouldered like the men who come from beyond the tweed straight as a dart a man who is not dependent upon dress and surroundings for his dignity but has an indefinable air of being superior to the common herd his features are good but not particularly regular hardly coming within the rule and compass of archetypal beauty the nose a thought too broad the forehead too dominant his skin is dark and has little colour save when he is angry or deeply moved when the stern face glows briefly with a dark crimson the clear cold grey eyes are wonderful in their variety of expression the firmly moulded yet flexible mouth is the best feature in his face supremely grave in repose infinitely tender when he smiles he smiles suddenly now in the course of his reverie a slow thoughtful smile 
what a child she is he says to himself with all a child's perversity i am foolish ever to be angry with her he heard a double knock from the little brass knocker of mr humphrey's private door shut his book with an impatient sigh got up and walked to the window the humphreys mansion was in one of the side streets of hawley a street known by the rustic title of field lane which led up a gentle hill to the open country a vast stretch of common land sprinkled sparsely on the outskirts with a few scattered houses and a row or two of cottages nor had mr humphreys any opposite neighbours the houses on the other side stopped abruptly a few yards below and there was a triangular green with a pond and a colony of ducks in front of the curate's casements malcolm ford looked out of the window expecting to see his visitor waiting meekly on the spotless doorstep but the door had been opened promptly and the doorstep was unoccupied he looked at his watch hastily i've been wasting too much time already he said to himself and here is someone to detain me ever so long and i want to make a good morning's round out filbury way the medical practitioners of hawley prided themselves on the crushing nature of their duties yet there were none among them who worked so hard as this healer of souls and here was some tiresome vestryman perhaps come to prose for half an hour or so about some pet grievance while he was languishing to be up and doing among the miserable hovels at filbury where amidst the fertile smiling landscape men's souls and bodies were consuming away with a moral dry rot the door of his sitting-room opened but not to admit a prosing vestryman the smiling handmaiden announced miss luttrell if you please sir and lo there stood before him on the threshold of his chamber the wilful woman he had been thinking about just now gravely regarding him the very image of decorum there was some change in her outward aspect the details whereof his masculine eye could not distinguish a woman could have told him in a moment by what means the beauty had contrived to transform herself she was dressed in a lavender cotton gown with tight plain sleeves and a linen collar no bright hued ribbon encircling the long white throat no flutter of lace or glimmer of golden locket none of the pretty frivolities with which she was accustomed to set off her loveliness she wore an old-fashioned black silk scarf a relic of her dead mother's wardrobe which became her tall slim figure to perfection she who was wont to wear the most coquettish and capricious of hats the daintiest conceit in airy tulle by way of a bonnet was now crowned with a modest saucer-shaped thing of dunstable straw which at this moment hid her eyes altogether from malcolm ford the rich brown hair which she had been accustomed to display in an elaborate structure of large loose plaits was neatly braided under this puritan headgear and packed into the smallest possible compass at the back of her head she had a little basket in one hand a red covered account book in the other if you please mr ford i should like you to give me a round of visits amongst your poor people she said offering him this little volume i'm quite ready to begin my duties to-day he stood for a moment gazing at her lost in amazement the provoking saucer-shaped hat covered her eyes he could only guess the expression of her face from her mouth which was gravity itself what miss luttrell do you mean to help me after all you said last night did i really say anything very wicked last night she asked naively lifting her head for a moment so that her eyes shone out at him under the shadow of the saucer brim peerless eyes they seemed to him in that brief flash but hardly the most appropriate eyes for a district visitor whose beauty should be of a subdued order like the colours of her dress i don't know that you said anything wicked but you expressed a profound disgust for district visiting oh, did i oh it was the last rebellious murmur of my unregenerate heart but you have awakened my conscience and i mean to turn over a new leaf to begin a new existence in fact if the piano were my property instead of diana's 
I think I should make a bonfire on the lawn and burn it. I have serious thoughts of burning my colour box, Windsor and Newton's too, and Papa's last birthday present. But you must be kind enough to make me out a list of the people you'd like me to visit. I don't want to be a regular district visitor, or to interfere with your established sisterhood in any way, so I won't take any tickets to distribute. I don't want the people to associate me with sacramental arms. I want to have a little flock of my own, and to see if I can make them like me for my own sake, without thinking how much they can get out of me. And if you could coach me a little about what I ought to say to them, it would be a great comfort to me. Gertrude says that when she feels herself at a loss, she says a little prayer and waits on the doorstep for a few minutes, till something comes to her. But I'm afraid that plan would not answer for me. Mr. Ford pushed one of the heavy chairs to the writing table near the window, and asked Miss Luttrell to sit down while he wrote what she wanted in the little red book. She seated herself near one end of the table, and he sat down to write at the other. "'I shall be very happy to do what I can to set you going,' he said as he wrote, "'but I should be more assured of your sincerity if you were less disposed to make a joke of the business.' "'A joke!' exclaimed Miss Luttrell with an aggrieved air. "'Why, I was never in my life so serious. "'Is this the way in which you mean to treat my awakening, Mr. Ford?' He handed her the little book, with a list of names written on the first leaf. "'I think you must know something of these people,' he said, "'after living here all your life.' Oh, "'Please don't take anything for granted about me with reference to the poor,' she answered hastily. "'Of course it, it is abominable in me to admit as much, but I never have cared for them. The only ideas about them that I have ever been able to grasp are they never open their windows, and that they always want something of one, and take it ill if one can't give them the thing they want. Gertrude tells quite a different story, and declares that the serious-minded souls are always languishing for spiritual refreshment, that she can make them quite happy with her prim little sermons and flimsy little tracts. Did you ever read a tract, Mr. Ford? I don't mean a controversial pamphlet or anything of that kind, but just one of those little puritanical booklets that drop from Gertrude like leaves from a tree in autumn. I have not given much leisure to that kind of study, replied Malcolm, with his grave smile. I hope you won't think me unappreciative of the honour involved in this visit, Miss Luttrell, if I am obliged to run away. I have a round of calls at Filbury to get through this morning. Oh, you remind me of poor Mamma," said Elizabeth, with a tributary sigh to the memory of that departed parent. She had always a round of calls, and they generally resolved themselves into three, a triangle of calls in short. But they were genteel visits, you know. Mamma never went in for the district business. The loose, slangy style of her talk grated upon his ear not a little. He took his hat and gloves from the sideboard, a gentle reminder that he was in haste to be gone. "'I won't detain you five minutes more,' she said. "'Oh, how nice the room looks with all these books. I know Mrs. Humphrey's drawing-room very well, although this is my first visit to you. Papa and Gertrude and I came once to drink tea with Mr. Horton.' He gave quite a party, and we had concertante duets for the flute and piano, non più mesta and di piace, and so on. This with a faint blush, remembering her own share in that concerted music. Oh, you should have seen the room in his tenancy. Bohemian glass vases and scent caskets and stereoscopes and photograph albums, but very few books. I think I like it best with all those grim-looking brown-backed volumes of yours. She made the tour of the room as she spoke, and paused by the mantelpiece to examine the skeleton clock, the cup and saucer, and the two portraits. What a grand-looking old lady! Your mother, of course, Mr. Ford. Uh, oh, what a sweet face! Pausing before the photograph. 
your sister i suppose no mr ford answered somewhat shortly and what a pretty cup and saucer under a glass shade it looks like a relic of some kind it is a relic the tone was grave repellent even and elizabeth felt she touched upon a forbidden subject it belonged to his mother i dare say she thought and he keeps it in memory of the dead i suppose all his people are dead as he never talks about them after this she made haste to depart with her little book knowing very well that she had outraged all the conventionalities of hawley but rather proud of having bearded this lion of judah in his den mr ford left the house with her and walked a little way by her side but was graver and more silent than his wont as if he had hardly recovered from the pain those injudicious questions of hers had given him he parted from her at the entrance to a row of cottages in which dwelt two of the matrons whose names he had entered in her book good-bye he said i hope you will be able to do some good and that you will not be tired of the work in a week or two oh, that's a rather depressing suggestion said elizabeth i know you have the worst possible opinion of me but i mean to show you how mistaken you've been and you really ought to be flattered by my conversion papa might have preached at me for a twelvemonth without producing such an effect i'm sorry to hear that your father has so little influence with you miss lutterell the curate answered gravely he left her with the coldest good-bye the proud face flushed crimson under the mushroom hat as she turned into the little alley this morning's interview had not been nearly so agreeable to her as yesterday's lecture under the limes at the entrance to the town she began her missionary work in a very bad humour but brightened by degrees as she went on she was a woman in whom the desire to please dominated almost every other attribute and she was bent upon making these people like or even love her it was not meant to be a mere spurt this adoption of a new duty she meant to show malcolm ford that she could be all or more than all he thought a woman should be that she could be as much gertrude's superior in this particular line as she surpassed her in personal beauty gertrude she said to herself contemptuously as if poor people could possibly care about gertrude with her little fidgety ways and her low church tracts and her passion for soapsuds and hearthstone she has contrived to train her people into a subdued kind of civility they look upon her visits as a necessary evil and put up with them just as they put up with the water coming through the roof or a pigsty close to the parlour window but i shall make my people look forward to my visits as a bright little spot in their lives this was rather an arrogant idea perhaps but elizabeth luttrell succeeded in realising it she contrived to win an unfailing welcome in the twenty cottages which mr ford had assigned to her nor was her popularity won by bribery and corruption she had very little to give her people except an occasional packet of barley sugar or a paper of biscuits for the children or now and then some cast-off ribbon or other scrap of genteel finery for the mothers for the sick children indeed she would do anything empty her own slenderly furnished purse rob the cross old parsonage cook of her arrowroot and loaf sugar and isinglass and cornflour and ground rice and eps cocoa and new-laid eggs but it was not by gifts of any kind that she made herself beloved it was the brightness and easy grace of her manner rather that delightful air of being perfectly at home in a tiny chamber with a reeking wash-tub at her elbow a cradle at her knee and a line of damp clothes steaming in close proximity to her hat nothing disgusted her she never wondered that people could live in such dirt and muddle she made her little suggestions of improvement no blunt plain-spoken recommendation of soap suds and hearthstone but insinuating hints of what might be done with a little trouble in a manner that never offended and then she was so beautiful to look upon the husbands and wives were never tired of admiring her 
Aye, but she be a rail right down beauty, they'd say, and thinks no more of herself than if she was as ugly as sin, not knowing that the fair Elizabeth was quite conscious of her own loveliness, and hoped to turn it to some good account by and by. Nor did Elizabeth forget, in her desire for popularity, that the chief object of her mission among these people was of a spiritual kind, that she was to carry enlightenment and religion into those close pent-up hovels where the damp linen was ever dangling, the wash-tub for ever reeking, where the larder was so often barren and the wants of mankind so small, and yet sometimes perforce unsatisfied. Although she was not herself, as Gertrude expressed it, seriously minded, though her thoughts during her father's sermons, and even during those of Mr. Ford, too often wandered among the bonnets and mantles of the congregation, or shaped themselves into vague visions of the future, she did, notwithstanding, contrive to bring about some improvement in the theory and practice of her clients. She persuaded the women to go to church on Sunday evenings, if Sunday morning worship was really an impossible thing, as the poor souls protested, she induced the husbands to clean themselves a couple of hours earlier than had been their Sabbath custom, and to shamble into the dusky aisle of St. Clement's or St. Mary's, while the tinkling five-minutes bell was still calling to loiterers and laggards on the way. She taught the little ones their catechism, rewarding proficiency with barley-sugar or gingerbread, and she sat by many a wash-tub reading the evangelist in her full sweet voice, while the industrious housewife rubbed the sweats of labour from her husband's shirt-collars. She would even starch and iron a handful of collars herself on occasion, if the housewife seemed to set about the business clumsily. "'I have to get up my own fine things sometimes, or I should go cuffless and collarless,' she said. "'Papa is not rich, you know, Mrs. Jones.' Whereat Mrs. Jones would be struck with the amazement at her handiness." I don't believe there's a thing in this universal world as you can't do, Miss Elizabeth, the admiring matron would cry with uplifted hands, and even this humble appreciation of her merits pleased Lizzie Luttrell. Her reading was much liked by listeners who were not compelled to sit with folded hands and a brain perplexed by the thought of neglected housework. She had a knack of choosing the most attractive as well as the most profitable portions of Holy Writ, an acute perception of the passages most likely to impress her hearers. "'I do like your scriptures, Miss Elizabeth,' said one woman. "'When I was a girl, I used to think the Bible was all Saul and the Philistines. There seemed no end of them, and David. I make no doubt David was a dear good man, and after the Lord's own heart. But there did seem too much of him. He wasn't like him, as you read about.' He didn't come home to us like that, miss, and you don't read as he was fond of little children, except that one of his own that he was so wrapped up in. The gospel sounds like a pretty story when you read it, miss, said another, and when Miss Gertrude read, it did seem so sing-song like. <laughs> Sometimes I couldn't feel as there was any sense in it, no more than in the lessons of a hot summer's afternoon when it seems only a droning, like a hive of bees. So Elizabeth went on and prospered, and grew really interested in her work. It was not half so bad as she supposed. There was muddle and there was want, but not such utter gloom and misery as she had imagined in these hovels. The spirits of these people were singularly elastic. Ever so little sunshine warmed them into new life, and above all they liked her and praised her, and spoke well of her to Malcolm Ford. She knew that from his approving manner, not from anything he had distinctly said upon the subject. Rarely had she met with him on her rounds. The list he had given her included only easy subjects, people who would not be likely to repulse her attentions, homes in which she would not hear foul language or see dreadful sights, and having allotted her pathway, he was content that she should follow it with very little assistance from him, and even took pains to time his own visits so as to avoid any encounter with her. He did, however, on rare occasions, find her among his flock. 
not easily did he forget one summer afternoon when he saw her sitting by an open cottage window with a sick child in her lap that figure in a pale muslin dress with the afternoon sunshine upon it lived in his memory long if only i could believe that she was quite in earnest he said to himself that this new work of hers has some safer charm than its novelty i should think her the sweetest woman i ever met except one elizabeth had been engaged in these duties for two months and had done her work faithfully it was the end of august the brilliant close of a summer that had been exceptionally fine harvest just begun in this western land and occasional tracts of tawny stubble baking under a cloudless blue sky hazelnuts and whortleberries ripening in the woods great slow trees shedding their purple fruit in every hedge a rain of green apples falling on the orchard grass with every warm south wind the red plums swelling and purpling on the garden wall a vision of plenty and the perfume of roses and carnations on every side if we don't have that picnic you talked about very soon gertie we shan't have it at all remarked the youngest and the pertest of the four sisters at breakfast one morning when mr luttrell had withdrawn himself to his daily duties and the damsels were left to enjoy half an hour's idleness and talk over empty coffee-cups and shattered egg-shells and other fragments of the feast the summer's nearly over you see gertie and if we don't take care we shall lose all the fine weather i've no doubt there'll be a deluge after all this sunshine blanche always called her eldest sister gertie when she wanted some indulgence from that important personage well i'm sure i don't know what to say blanche replied miss luttrell with provoking coolness as if picnics and all such sublunary pleasures were utterly beneath her regard strong too in her authority as her father's housekeeper and conscious that her sisters must bow down and pay her homage for whatever they wanted like joseph's brethren in quest of corn i really think she went on with a deliberate air as the summer is nearly gone we may as well give up any notion of a picnic this year especially as papa doesn't seem to care much about it papa never seems to care about anything that costs money cried the disrespectful youngest he'd like life well enough if everything in it could be carried on for nothing if his children could be born and educated and fed and clothed and doctored and nursed and introduced to society gratis so that he could have all the pew rents and burial fees and things to put in the bank it's very mean of you to talk like that gertrude and want to sneak out of the picnic when it's about the only return we're likely to make for all the croquet parties and dinners and teas and goodness knows what that our friends have given us since christmas really blanche you are learning to render yourself eminently disagreeable miss luttrell observed severely and i fear if papa does not face the necessity of sending you back to school to be finished your deficiency in manner will be your absolute ruin in after-life never mind blanche's manner interposed diana but let's talk about the picnic of course we must have one we always have had one for the last five years since the summer after poor mamma's death i know we were all in slight mourning at the first of them and our friends expect it so the only question is where are we to go this year this was intended in some wise as an assertion of independence on the part of the second miss luttrell who did not intend to be altogether overridden by the chariot of an elder sister even though that elder had bidden a long farewell to the golden summer tide of her twenty-eighth year elizabeth won't go of course now she's turned serious said blanche with a sly glance at lizzie who sat leisurely watching the skirmish with her head against the clumsy frame of the lattice and the south wind gently stirring her dark brown hair a perfect picture of idle loveliness you'll have nothing to do with the picnic of course lizzie not even if malcolm ford goes pursued the pickle of the family who gave you leave to call him malcolm flashed out elizabeth no 
one but why shouldn't one enjoy oneself in the bosom of one's family i like to call him malcolm ford it's such a pretty name and one ought to get accustomed to the christian name of one's future brother-in-law two of the miss lutterells flushed crimson at this speech gertrude who turned angrily upon the speaker as if about to retort and elizabeth whose swift reply came like a flash of lightning before her senior could reprove the offender how dare you say that blanche do you suppose that i would marry mr ford a curate even if he were to ask me i won't suppose anything till he does ask you answered the incorrigible and then i know pretty well what will happen whatever fine notions you may have had about a rich husband and a house in london and an opera box and goodness knows what will all count for nothing the day that malcolm ford makes you an offer why you worship the ground he walks on do you think we can't all of us see through your district visiting a pretty freak for you to take up after admitting that you detested such work i suppose it is not quite unnatural that one should try to overcome one's dislikes and to do some good in the world replied elizabeth with dignity have the goodness to bridle your tongue a little blanche and rest assured that i shall never marry a curate be he whom he may but mr ford is not like common curates he is independent of the church he has private means yes three or four hundred a year from a small estate in aberdeenshire oh you have been making enquiries then no but i heard papa say as much one day and now blanche be so kind as to abandon the discussion of my affairs and of mr ford's and let us talk of the picnic i say lawborough beaches this i say was uttered in a tone of authority unbefitting a third sister and gertrude immediately determined not to brook any such usurpation but it somehow generally happened that elizabeth had her own way she had a happy knack of suggesting the right thing lawborough beaches is a jolly place said blanche approvingly oh when will you learn to abandon the use of that odious adjective cried gertrude with a shudder lawborough beaches is low and damp well i'd as soon have it on the moor and we could have donkey races and no end of fun oh was there ever a girl with such vulgar ideas donkey races imagine mr ford riding a donkey with a piece of white calico on its back and imagine picnicking on the moor without a vestige of shade a oh, nice blistered state our faces would be in and i should have one of my nervous headaches said diana who had a kind of copyright in several interesting ailments of the nervine kind lawborough beaches was a little wood of ancient trees with silver-grey trunks and spreading crests beaches which had been pollarded in the days when cromwell rode rough-shod over the land and had stretched out their mighty limbs low and wide in the centuries that had gone by since then it was a little wood lying in a green hollow through which the tabor meandered a silvery stream dear to the soul of the fly-fisher here dark and placid as a lake under the broad shadow of the trees and there flowing with a swift current towards the distant weir miss lutterell acknowledged somewhat unwillingly after a good deal of discussion that the beaches was perhaps the best place for the picnic if the picnic were really a social necessity i must confess i do not see it in that light she said and i rather wonder that you should do so elizabeth now that your mind has been awakened to loftier interests the sum which this picnic will cost would be a great help to our blanket club next winter elizabeth pondered for a few moments of course she was anxious to help those poor people who were so fond of her but the winter was a long way off providence might increase her means in some unthought-of manner by that time and the near delight of a long summer afternoon with malcolm ford under lawborough beeches was very sweet to her 
she had seen so little of him of late the very change in herself which she had fancied would bring them nearer together seemed to have only the more divided them she did not meet him half so often as in her unregenerate days when she had been always strolling in and out of hawley to change books at the library or to buy a new song or a yard or two of ribbon or to look at the last paris fashions which the chief linen draper had just received from plymouth we ought to make some return for people's hospitality she said i consider the picnic unavoidable so blanche produced a sheet of fool's cap and began to make out a formidable list of comestibles pigeon pies chicken salads lobsters plovers eggs galantine of veal hams tongs salmon on mayonnaise and so on with a wild profusion that seems so easy in pen and ink i wish you would not be so officious blanche exclaimed the eldest miss luttrell of course i shall arrange all those details with susan sims susan sims was the cook an important functionary in the vicar's household who managed miss luttrell that means that we are to have whatever susan likes to give us said blanche you do give way to her so gertrude i think i'd rather have a bad cook and one's dinner spoilt occasionally if one could order just what one liked however i suppose if i mayn't make out a list of the dinner i may make a list of the people yes you can if you'll just take your inkstand to another table you've made a blot upon the tablecloth already upon this the three elder damsels separated to pursue their divers occupations gertrude to hold solemn converse with susan sims diana to practise mendelssohn's sonatas on the drawing-room piano elizabeth to her district visiting leaving blanche wallowing in ink and swelling with importance as she wrote the names of her father's friends on two separate sheets of fool's cap the people who must be invited upon one the people who might or might not be invited upon the other mr luttrell happened to be at home for luncheon that day a privilege which he was not permitted to enjoy more than once or twice a week so the sisters were able to moot the question of the picnic without delay the vicar rubbed his bald forehead thoughtfully with a perplexed sigh i suppose we must do something he said dolefully it's a long time since we've had a dinner party and if you think people really like their dinner any better on damp grass gertrude and with flies dropping into their wine why have a picnic by all means there's always an immense deal of wine drunk at these affairs by the way young men are so officious and go opening bottles on the least provocation be sure you remind me to write and order some of the ball supper champagne and the racecourse moselle that we saw advertised the other day the matter was settled therefore pleasantly enough and the invitations were written that afternoon and distributed before nightfall by the parsonage gardener or man of all work mr ford's invitation among them a formal little note in gertrude's hand which he twisted about in his fingers for a long time while he meditated upon his answer would it do him any good to waste a summer day under lawborough beeches he had been working his hardest for some weeks without relaxation of any kind he felt that he wanted rest and ease but hardly this species of recreation which would involve a great deal of trouble for he would be required to make himself agreeable to all manner of people to carry umbrellas and camp-stools to point out interesting objects in the landscape to quote the county history and in fact to labour assiduously for the pleasure of other people nor had he ever felt himself any the better for these rustic pleasures considerably the worse rather especially when they were shared with elizabeth luttrell no better to waste his day in utter loneliness on the moor under the shadow of a mighty tor with a book lying unread at his side better to give himself a pause of perfect rest in which to think out the great problem of his life for without inordinate self-esteem malcolm ford was a man who deemed that his existence ought to be of some use to the world 
that he was destined to fill some place in the scheme of creation he felt that alfresco banquetings and junketings were just the idlest most worthless use that he could make of his rare leisure and yet with very human inconsistency he wrote to miss luttrell next morning to accept her kind invitation End of chapter 3